Good morning and welcome. My name's Craig and I'm a senior pastor here. It is our privilege to have you with us. Thank you so much for giving of your time. Please excuse my ugly bottle, but my voice started doing crazy things in the first service and that's all I got. So I apologize for that. Uh, if you're a guest with us this morning, thank you so much for being with us. Please do me the favor. I know Pastor Adams already mentioned it, but please fill out a, 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 a thank you, one of those, yes, a guest card for us. You can do that. It's either in the worship folder that was given to you when you came in. You can do it that way, or you can do it online at malvernhill.org slash connect. We just want to know that you are here. I'd like to drop you a letter in the mail this week, and thank you for visiting with us. I'm not going to come see you this afternoon, I promise. I like you, but I'm not coming to your house. So if you guys would do that, that would help us out a whole lot. We're going to be in the book of Acts chapter 25 in just a minute. Acts chapter 25, if you want to go ahead and start turning there. And as you are, let me just offer a couple of announcements for you uh, that you might need to be aware of. Number one, there is a meeting right after this service for anyone interested in participating in a special needs ministry here. Uh, Erin Taylor is going to meet with you. Will you raise your hand, Erin? She's right up here at the front. So she'll meet somewhere in this general area. I think she kind of stood on the, sat on the steps right up here in the early service. So she'll be right up here. Um, if you've got any, any interest in helping to assist with a special needs ministry here, please come see her. Uh, a reminder that we do have uh, parent-child baby dedication coming up in a couple of weeks. So if you've not already signed up to participate in that, uh, please do so if you are interested in having your children dedicated. Uh, third, tonight at 6 o'clock there is uh, a community worship service here uh, for teenagers. We're hoping to have 350 or so teenagers that are here this evening. You are welcome and invited to come, but just know it's going to be a little bit louder than you're used to and it's going to be a whole bunch of kids. So uh, we'd love to have you. Please pray for us as we seek to share the gospel with kids. I'm going to tell you, I'm preaching tonight. Um, pray for my voice because it's been a little bit crazy, but um, pray specifically that this evening uh, the, the challenge that we're going to be giving to these kids is not just a challenge for the gospel, but encouraging and challenging them to get into the Word. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in, in my sermon. But uh, uh, please be praying about that for us. We'd appreciate it. Finally this morning, just thank you. I don't have all the final numbers just yet, uh, but apparently we had a really good month in, in July financially. And I just appreciate you guys being faithful and giving. Adam's actually going to come in a few minutes and talk to you about some needs we continue to have because God continues to open some awesome doors. Um, but just know that we have those needs because of doors that continue to be open, not because you guys aren't doing so many wonderful things and, and being um, uh, just responsible with that and, and gracious and kind and generous in your giving. And I just appreciate that. All right, having said all that now, I'm going to ask you if you would to stand with me in honor of God's word. We're going to be in, again, Acts chapter 25 beginning in verse 1. All right, here we go. Now, three days after Festus had arrived from the province, time out, hold on, I forgot to remind you, Paul's in jail. Remember, we've been looking at Paul in jail for a while. Paul went to jail. He's kind of been uh, jostled about from one trial to another, and now he's in Caesarea, and he's on trial again. All right, let's pick back up. Now, three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul, and they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul, that he summon him to Jerusalem because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So, said he, let the men of authority among you go down with me. And if there is anything wrong about the man, let them bring charges against him. After he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea. In the next day, he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul argued that, uh, excuse me, Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then, I'm, if then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar." Then Festus, when he had conferred with his council, answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for loving us, and thank you for this word that never fails. 
I pray, Father, that as we wrestle through this passage of Scripture, that you would show us, Lord God, how it is that we might take the road less traveled. Father God, show us how it is that we might be willing to do whatever is necessary to serve you faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. You know, usually when I ask the question, how far are you willing to go to serve the Lord? Or what would you be willing to do to serve the Lord? Uh, people are, are, are ready with, with an answer, right? And if it's a big thing, people think of those things. Like, I, I'd be willing to, to give up my, my, my home for the Lord. Or I'd be willing to even give up my life. You might be willing to go to the fire as Daniel did in, in the story of Daniel in, or excuse me, not of Daniel. I just completely butchered that. I, I said it wrong in the first service. Uh, but of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they went to the fire there in that story in the book of Daniel. Uh, and, and many of us feel like we would be willing to do the big things for the Lord. You know, if God asked me to stand in front of thousands and to proclaim his name, I'd be willing to do that. But the reality is that many of the things that God calls us to do are not the big things. They are the small things, the small acts of obedience. Eugene Peterson wrote a book uh, about 20 years ago called um, uh, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And, and much of the Christian life is that. It's not the process or the experience doing these massive, huge things for Christ and for the gospel. Instead, it's a life lived in faithful obedience in the small things. And over time, that faithful obedience in the small things adds up to making a significant impact in the world around us. When we think about the Apostle Paul, we sort of think about the big things that Paul did. But the reality is that Paul's big things were an accumulation of small things, small acts of obedience, small commitments in discipleship that ultimately and eventually led to Paul making a significant impact for the gospel, not only really in the small section of the world where he lived, but ultimately across the entire globe and that has spanned now for 2,000 years. What did Paul do that was such a big deal? Paul listened to God's word and obeyed God's word and Paul walked through the doors that God opened for him. In other words, Paul was faithful in the small things and through that faithful ministry in the small things, God used Paul to make an, an outsized impact in the world. This morning, this is a passage of scripture that if it weren't for the fact that we are preaching through the book of Acts, all right? So let me just be clear with you. If I was not preaching through the book of Acts, I probably would not select this passage of scripture to preach. It's challenging to preach through. But the reason that we preach through entire books or big sections of the Bible at one time is so that we can wrestle with all of it. And so this morning, we have a passage of scripture where Paul is standing before a tribunal. He's standing on trial for what seems like the 15th time in a row. Paul just can't get out of court right now. And yet here he is, and in this particular passage of Scripture, I believe that there are at least three big things that we can walk away from to help us understand how it is that we might serve the Lord faithfully and how it is that we might take the road less traveled in our own lives. The first thing that we've got to be willing to do, that you've got to be willing to do, is you've got to seek God's direction. Seek God's direction. Now, we think about the Apostle Paul. Um, he was constantly seeking the Lord's direction, and, and that's kind of where we've got to be, right? But we've got to think about how we're going to get there. Just this week, I had a phone call from a guy who uh, had all sorts of questions about God and all sorts of beliefs about who God was. And as we began to talk about Jesus, he had all sorts of beliefs about Jesus. And I said, tell me about where these things have come from. And, and he's talking to him about all these things that he's read and all these things that he's done. And he tells me who Jesus really is. And I said, well, brother, as you're thinking about who Jesus really is, I, I said, the problem I have with what you're telling me is that Jesus has told us who he really is in the Gospels. And the picture that you're painting doesn't line up with where Jesus actually said he was. I said, so where do you get that? And he said, well, I've read here and I've read there. I said, well, brother, how about this? How about if you read the gospel accounts of Jesus and read what Jesus has to say about himself and then you and I have another conversation because I believe that when you seek God's direction in his word, you're going to find something different. You're going to actually discover who God is. See, we've got to be willing to go to the actual place where we can get there. We've got to seek God through his word. Now, that doesn't mean that you might not find... Um, interaction you might not find instruction you might not find education in a few other places 
you might find good advice in a couple of other places, but more than anything, if you're going to know who God is and know about the Lord, you've got to dig into his word. Just yesterday, um, I went to help my brother, who has recently purchased some, some piece of property to hunt on. I went to help him put up some hunting stands. And um, when I agreed to go, I had him send me the address. And I took the address, and here's what I did. I, I put it into my phone, into my GPS, so I could figure out how to get there. I, I rolled over yesterday morning, and I told Angela, I said, I'm really not eager about going to do all this hot, sweaty, nasty work today. But I only get, you know, God's not making any more brothers for me today, so I'm going to go and take care of my brother. But I, I didn't look at Angela and say, tell me how to get there. Because she didn't even know where I was going. You know, I didn't call one of y'all and say, tell me how to get there. I, I used a map. I used the thing that knows where I need to be. Y'all, so often when we're seeking to discover and understand what God's direction is for us, we look everywhere except the place where we need to be. This is where the answers lie, right here in this book. So um, tonight, for instance, what we're going to do as a part of this service is we're challenging kids. We're not only going to present the gospel, but we're challenging all the students that will show up. We want to challenge them to spend this, this semester, this one semester, investing their time in reading one chapter of God's Word a day. Right Now that doesn't seem like a ton, but we believe that even with just one chapter a day, that if we've got hundreds of students across this county consuming God's Word on a consistent basis, we believe that the Word of God is powerful to change lives. And so I want you to be praying for me with that. We, we've created a website. We're giving them these little orange. They're horrible orange. Like we, and this is why. We understand that there are Clemson fans here um, and I'm not one, and so there was this question about should they be orange. I said, well, it is the ugliest color known to mankind, and so it should grab attention. And so that's why they're orange. Um, that's not true. I made all that up on the spot. But uh, webs, uh, little bracelets and stickers that have a website on them. And the website, you go to the website, it's a super simple website that one of our guys built for us here. And that website takes them right to a Bible reading guide. See, we, we know teenagers well enough to know that we challenge them to read the Word. We want to encourage them to read the Word. But they can't keep up with anything. We're lucky if they keep up with their head. And so we knew that we had to figure out some way to keep that Bible reading guide in front of them. So we got a website and we put a bracelet on their wrist and a sticker that they can stick on anything. And if they can just remember that website, they can go to that website and download their Bible reading guide. And they can keep up because we believe that the Word of God is that powerful and that important. I want to encourage you to read God's Word if you want to know what God wants from you. Now, some of you have a pattern and a habit of doing that. There are some of you that may read four or five or six chapters a day. Wonderful. That's great. Some of you have a habit of reading about three chapters a day. Uh, I, I don't know if you know this, but if you read about three chapters a day, you can make it through the Bible in a year. Right? Just about three chapters a day. But here's the cool thing. If you're a person that says, I just don't know if I can do that. I can't consume all that. I feel overwhelmed when I begin to dig into the Word. Watch this. If you read one chapter of the Bible a day, you know that in just about three years you could read through the entire thing. You look at this and it just looks like this massive book, especially if you've got one of those big study Bibles, you know, and you, you look at it and it just seems so overwhelming. But one chapter a day, just a little bit at a time, and next thing you know you've actually read through the most important book that's ever been written. You've consumed all of it. This is where we go to find God's direction in the Word of God. I hope that you'll do that. I hope that you'll do it every day of your life. I hope you'll make it a pattern, right? And if you say, Craig, I'm not much of a reader. It's difficult for me to do all that. First of all, I would say, even if it's hard, do it anyway. Hard things are worth doing, so I would encourage you. But I also remind you that, that even though this is one of the greatest deterrents to our spiritual growth in the whole wide world, there's also some incredible opportunities that exist on this little thing. You can download the Bible. Uh, in any translation that you want and you can make it play for you, right? You can hook it up and it'll just read the Bible to you when you're driving down the road. So I just encourage you, take in God's Word. If you want to know how you can serve the Lord, seek God's direction. Seek it first and foremost from His Word. The second place, though, this morning as we think about seeking God's direction, I would encourage you to pursue godly wisdom from others. Now, here's what Paul did. Paul had God's word that came to him. If we go to Acts and we turn back to Acts chapter 23, there at the very last, uh, no, I'm sorry, that's not the last verse, but in, in chapter 11 of Acts 23, the Bible says that the, the Lord came to Paul and said, Take courage. For as you have testified the facts about me in Jerusalem, you, so you must testify also in Rome. How could Paul have the courage to, to ask to be sent to Rome? How could Paul have the courage 
to say, I appeal to Caesar. Well, Paul had gone to the Lord and the Lord had given him his word and the Lord had said to Paul, you need to be going to Rome. So he's got it in his word and you need to get it in his word. But even as you're wrestling through that, I would encourage you not to stop there, but to pursue godly wisdom from others. This is so important. Now, in your study guide for next week, you're going to see this is in there, but I want to go ahead and ask you to turn today to Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. It's in the middle of your Bible. If you can't get there, you can't find it, don't, don't freak out. It's in, the, in your worship guide, and you can go back and find it later. But Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15 says this. It says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Y'all, if you're going to know how to serve the Lord effectively, if you're going to know how far you need to go in serving Jesus, I want to encourage you to find godly counsel, godly advice, to find friends that you can lean on. Now, notice I said godly advice. How do we know the difference? Well, first of all, I would encourage you to focus on finding people that have a relationship with the Lord, that are plugged into a local church, that are committed to the Lord, and, and that they're digging into God's Word. So then when you're going to them and you're asking for advice, they're not just flipping a quarter to figure out what they're going to tell you. They're actually able to back up their advice for you with the Word of God. Right, So I would encourage you, this is where our life groups are so important because you've got a small group of people that you can lean into and you can wrestle through the texts of God's word with. You can wrestle through opportunities together. There are people that you can lean on. Okay, But again, I would encourage you to find people, people of various sorts. Find people who are, are super encouraging. Those are great people to have when I need advice in my life. But also find people who will disagree with you. You need to find somebody who will look at you and say, I don't think that's right. Because otherwise, you just surround yourself with a whole bunch of people that always tell you what you want to hear. And you end up always doing what you want because those people are just so nice and they never tell you no. Sometimes what I want is not the right thing. Okay? Let me tell you where you don't go. Don't, don't run to Facebook and like type in your next uh, big decision you're trying to make and ask for advice. Because you will get terrible advice. Okay? Terrible advice. Like if you're just looking for somebody to unclog your drain, go for it. That's great. Maybe that works out for you. If you're trying to decide if you should remain faithful to your spouse, don't run to Facebook. Right? Because you'll find people doing the most ridiculous things. Whatever it takes to make you happy. That's not what God's Word says, right? You need to make sure that you're running to people who are committed to the Lord and committed to the things of the Lord. And those are the people that are helping you to rightly divide the word and understand the word of God, but also the people that are helping you to rightly divide and understand your own emotions, your own desires, your own plans. Find those people that can help you to apply God's word to your life. So the first thing, seek God's direction. The second thing this morning, and we see Paul doing this, the second thing is obey today, right now. Now, this is Paul's pattern throughout his life. It's just regular, over and over, sometimes relatively boring obedience. Y'all, we've got to, once the Lord has told us what is good and acceptable for us, what is right for us to do, then our responsibility is to do it when? Right now. Right now, parents, I'm just curious, has there ever been a point in time in your life with, with children that they've disobeyed you for like three, four, five days, and then like day six, they just wake up and they go, you know, today, even after this whole building of disobedience today, I want to undo all the things that I've done. I've, I've refused to clean my room or, or ignored you or just haven't done it for like the last five days, but today when I wake up, today I, I'm going to organize my Legos by colors and size, and I'm going to vacuum my room, and I'm going to throw things away just because I want to obey right that's a fantasy world it doesn't exist and if it exists in your house please come talk to me because I'm doing something really wrong right listen watch delayed obedience is disobedience and leads to more of the same we don't ascend the steps of disobedience and suddenly find ourselves desiring to do the right thing the truth of the matter is we tend to desire to continue to do the thing we've been doing. And disobedience leads to more disobedience and more disobedience and more disobedience. And it's important for us to think through that. And this is why. There's something inside of us that sort of says, well, you know, when the time comes, I'll do the right thing. 
when it's time for the big thing, I'll do the right thing. I used to coach a little bit of football, and so it's football season. And one of the great things about athletics in general is this. It's great to see players that don't do what they're supposed to do in practice. It's great to see them ignore their coaches and just do the thing that they want to do. And then I love this. Well, in a game, I'll do the right thing. Let me tell you what. You ain't going to do the right thing in a game. You ain't going to do it. If you did it wrong all week, you're going to do it wrong on Friday or Thursday or whenever. Whatever you've been doing is what you're going to continue to do. There's some of you that have sort of convinced yourself that there's like the little things of the Lord that you don't have to really put that much attention to. And then there's the big things. And I'm not going to worry about the little things, but when the big things come up, I'll be there. Folks, we won't be. Let me give you a real life example that a lot of you can really um, relate to. A, 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 a lot, probably a lot of you here today and a lot of people in our culture. COVID created um, a scenario where a lot of people got out of, you ready, got out of the habit of going to church. I don't know how many people told me that. Like, I just got out of the habit. And, and they didn't do it on purpose. No, nobody just woke up and said, I'm just going to walk away from the church. But, you know, maybe, maybe showing up, if you were part of our church during that time, it was a little awkward. We worshiped outside, inside, and online all at the same time. And you, you woke up one morning in August, you said, it's going to be 98 degrees. That moron preacher is going to be out there preaching in the heat in the parking lot. I, I don't want to go out there and have a heat stroke. And then you said, but you know what, I, I, I don't know that I, I don't really want to go sit in there and watch it on screen either in the sanctuary. Um, so, so we'll just do it online today and then you roll over and maybe our internet feed was bad or your internet feed was bad and you said you know and you just shut it off you know it's, it's just too much trouble today well the next week you look around and you realize hey you know what it's, it's a lot of trouble to get everybody up and ready just to go sit in the parking lot and sweat so so we'll just plan to sit together as a family and and we'll watch the worship service together. And you, you did that, and it went okay until somebody spilled their cereal and somebody sat on somebody's leg, and that was kind of aggravating. And the next week, you sit around, and you go, well, we were going to have family time around the computer and watch this worship service, but you know what? Family time's what really matters. And so just this once, we're just going to head out to the lake, and, and we'll have a good time as a family because that's, that's what we should be doing anyway. And you go out to the lake, and you have a good time, and that's Sunday number three. By Sunday number four, you hadn't even thought, about whether the church is involved because the lake was pretty good and you just get out of the habit right and you look up six months later and you've not been plugged into the church and you don't really know what happened because you didn't you didn't do it on purpose you just kind of got out of the habit obedience is a habit and disobedience is a habit some of you also know you ready we got some awesome stories of folks who have spent uh some years in their life saying we need to get into church we need to get into church and we make all sorts of excuses. My favorite one is, is a Craig Thompson excuse. You ready? Well, next month when things slow down, we'll get into that. Y'all, next month hasn't arrived yet for me. Like, it, nothing seems to ever slow down. Everything just kind of keeps moving into greater de degrees of complexity in my life. But there's some of you that finally reached the point that said, I don't know when next month is going to get here, but we know that we've got to change this pattern and we've got to get our family engaged in a local church. And you changed your habits right then. Well, what you discovered is that first Sunday was pretty challenging and the second Sunday was hard. And maybe there were a few months of just struggle to get there, but then you, you created a new pattern and you discovered that over time that, that pattern began to take hold. Y'all, I want to encourage you to obey God's word today because just as disobedience can be a pattern, we can actually begin to establish patterns of obedience. And that's what the Apostle Paul had. The Apostle Paul had heard the Lord say, you need to be in Rome, right? And, and, and he had said, you're fine. I've got you under control. Everything's all right. Paul could have then spent the next days and weeks as he's incarcerated just pitching an absolute tantrum lord you said you had me where are you but instead what do we see the apostle paul doing just walking in daily regular ordinary obedience and trusting that through that process that god's going to do something y'all can i encourage you that god is going to do more in your life through years and a lifetime of regular obedience, then in all the big things are going to take place. You're going to experience so much more in the years of regular obedience. Some of those acts of obedience are not going to set the whole world on fire. Some of those acts of obedience are just going to be 
plain and normal and ordinary, but it's through those ordinary means of grace that God is molding you and changing you. This past Wednesday night, we talked about the Word of God. And, and the Word of God is living and active, is what the Bible says. But when we talk about the Word of God being living and active, we're not speaking of that in the same way that some legal scholars would talk about the Constitution as a living document or a living Constitution. Legal scholars who would say that suggest that the Constitution, for instance, should change and morph and mold as society changes. That the Constitution should be constantly growing, that it should be living with the culture. When the Bible speaks of itself as a living word, and when we cling to that, we're not suggesting that this word should be molding and changing to fit society. Just the opposite. What we say is that it is living and active, and that it is it is able to mold and change people. That happens through daily acts of obedience. How else is it that we might serve the Lord? How do we find that willingness to serve Him faithfully? Third this morning, walk through open doors. Remember what I said? Paul was told by the Lord that he was going to go to Rome. Now, Paul probably had a vision for what it was going to look like for him to get to Rome. Okay? It probably was not in change. You understand? Paul's vision was probably not that he would get there, but here's what Paul knew. Paul said, go to Rome. And Paul is looking for that open door to get there. Listen to me. I've said this to you many times through the years, but I'll say it to you again, and I'll say it many times in the future, I promise. God's will is much easier to understand in the rearview mirror than it is through the windshield. God's will for our life is much easier for me to understand when I look back. I can look back, and in my history, I can see the way that the Lord was working and orchestrating and, and paving things just so so that he would get me to the places where he would have me to be. But oftentimes, when I'm walking by faith into God's plans for my life, I don't see those very clearly defined roads. I don't know that Paul saw a very clearly defined road right here. Right? Paul is on trial. He's done absolutely nothing wrong. He's maintaining his innocence. And yet, when... When he's asked, do you want to go back to Jerusalem? Paul says, I'm going to play the trump card right here. I appeal to Caesar. Folks, this is not normal. If you don't know that it's normal, just look with me at the text. The Bible says that in verse 12, then Festus, when he conferred with his council. Why in the world does Festus need to confer with his council? Because there's two things that are happening here. First of all, Paul's sort of taking his own life in his hands when he appeals to go to Caesar. This is not like you stand before Caesar and he pats you on the back and says, you know, everything's good. This is the most powerful man in the Western world. And Paul's appealed to stand before him and for Caesar to make the decision as to whether or not he should live or die. Whether or not he has any right to even be there. But here's the other thing Festus knows. Festus knows that when Paul appeals to Caesar, if he approves that appeal, he's kind of sticking his neck out a little bit here as well. This is not a normal thing. So he confers with his people and says, can we do this? Should we do this? Is it what, this what we have to do? This is way out of the ordinary. Why would Paul do it? Because the Lord had told Paul to go to Rome. And here's what Paul saw. Get that rhyme? It's good, right? Here's what Paul saw. You could have at least smiled. I tried. Nothing. He at least saw a sliver of daylight through an open door. I, I don't believe that Paul could see in this place a wide open door for where he was headed. Paul knew one thing that he was supposed to get to Rome. And he saw a sliver of daylight streaming through a cracked door. And Paul said, if there's any chance that that door might open for me, I'm going to step forward. Folks, if you want to honor the Lord with your life, you got to seek Him, and you got to obey Him, and then you've just got to walk through open doors. Now, here's the thing about open doors. They open by faith. They open by faith. The doors that God calls us to often just show just a, a slight hint of hope, and the Lord's waiting for us to take that step, just like when you walk up to those automatic doors at the grocery store. We're walking by faith that when I step up, those things are going to actually open. We're taking those steps by faith, trusting that God's going to open the doors that he wants me to walk through. And folks, can I tell you, he's not standing around somewhere watching you, trying to trick you into doing something. He's not desiring for you to fail. 
on the window of my shop right now, there's some red feathers on one of the windows. I know why there are red feathers on that window. I know that somewhere along the way, a red bird flew into that window and left his mark. And so there are red feathers where his little red head hit that window. Honestly, I hope it's one of those red-headed woodpeckers that keeps pecking holes and everything. But there's, don't roll your lips out, right? I haven't murdered the birds, but I have holes in everything I own because of those sweet angels. Anyway, um, there's red feathers. Now, I haven't found a red body. I don't know if that means that he was a strong little birdie and he flew away or if a cat wandered into my yard and had a, a free meal. I have absolutely no idea. I know that a red bird hit that window, though. I know that for a fact. Why did that red bird hit that window? Because that red bird saw glass and kept on flying. Can I tell you something? The Lord's not putting glass doors in front of you, standing around waiting to see if you'll run into that door. He's not trying to trick you. God's not faking you out. When he gives you an open door, walk through it. Now, now we know that Paul is walking through this door to Rome, but this isn't the first time. Paul's been praying for the Lord to give him direction all along. So we see Paul earlier in Acts when he's trying to go one direction. The Bible says that God sent him to Macedonia. There's this Macedonian call, get there. Paul's going one place. God closes one door, but he opens another one. And Paul just keeps on walking. Y'all, listen, if we're going to serve the Lord faithfully, we've got to walk through open doors. Look with me at this vast passage of Scripture that Paul's going to write to us um, from jail to the church in Philippi. It says this, Press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Y'all, this is what it's like to walk through open doors, to keep pressing on, to keep moving forward. We, we've got to understand that in these moments, in these challenges, sometimes those doors are not going to open until just the last minute. I know. I get it. I'm, I'm like a whole lot of y'all. I would love to be able to give you guys the next six-year plan of my faith journey. I'd love to be able to give you yours. But the reality is that the Lord is more likely to give you six months or six days than he is six years. Why? But because he's called us to walk by faith and not by sight. To trust him. He's called on us to trust that he's going to grab us by the hand. And he's going to lead us where we need to go. And we're going to be okay. So in conclusion this morning, how far are you willing to go? How far are you willing to go to serve the Lord? I'm thrilled to death if you're willing to go to the ends of the earth. But are you willing to go to the end of your stairs in the morning and begin by reading God's word before you get, a, get up and go to work? You're willing to go to the ends of the earth, but are you willing to go to the end of your road and share the good news with somebody there who needs to hear it? You're willing to do huge things for the Lord. Are you willing to do the small things? Y'all know the truth. Until we're willing to do the small things, we're not worthy to do the big things. But it's not just that. Until we do the small things, we can't be prepared for the big things. Listen, God's called us to follow the Apostle Paul and to take the road less traveled. I promise you that the road to Rome by way of appeal to Caesar was not one that was traveled very often. But it was the road that God had laid out for the Apostle Paul. And through many acts of obedience in the same direction, Paul was able to find an opportunity to make an outsized impact for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Y'all, this isn't the kind of sermon that sets the whole world on fire. And that's okay. Because much of the fire that we need to kindle in our lives comes one spark, one ember, one small flame at a time. It comes one verse, one chapter, one act of obedience. And with each small act of obedience, you build yourself closer to a life lived in a Godward direction that can make an impact, not just in this moment, but can make an impact for all of eternity. So where are you today? What is it that God would have of you? For some of you, 
The next step of faith might be a step in salvation. That today can be the day that you know the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior. Today, that might be the step that God would have you to take. For some of you, the step he would have you to take is just a commitment to get up tomorrow morning. And for it to be the first day of a lifetime lived, spending time in his word. For some of you, though, the step may be to step through the open door that you've been running from for days, weeks, months, or years. As we stand in just a moment and sing, I'm praying that the Lord would give you the courage to take that next step of faith, to trust him, to carry you the rest of the way. Pray with me. Father God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for a word that never fails, never runs out. Help us, Father God, to trust you, to faithfully live lives of quiet and patient obedience. Father God, move among us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with us as we sing. Thank you for joining with us here online at Malvern Hill Baptist Church. We would love to get to know you better and to pray with you. If you would like to be contacted for prayer or to find out how to become a follower of Christ, or maybe you just want to find out more about Malvern Hill, please fill out our connection card online at www.malvernhill.org connect. You can also go there to our website. You'll find a lot of information about our church. There's sermons, there's resources. There's other tools that can help you to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can even give to the work of ministry right there from our website. Thank you so much for being here with us. We hope that you can join us in person very soon. But until that time, I pray that God would bless you in this week as you seek to honor him with your life. I hope to see you soon. Have a great week.